join me in the prayer for illumination. Guide us, O oh God, by your word and spirit, that in your light we may see light, in your truth find freedom, and in your will discover your peace through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Old Testament reading this morning is from Psalm 34, 1 through 8. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul boast, makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he answered me, and delivered me from all my fears. Look to him and be radiant, so your faces shall never be ashamed. This poor soul cried and was heard by the Lord and was saved from every trouble. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Happy are those who take refuge in him. Here ends the first reading. Um, the epistle reading today is from Ephesians. It's chapter, one moment. It's chapter four, verses 25, all the way through uh, chapter five, verse two, but don't worry, it's not really, really long. Let's listen for God's word to each of us and to the whole world. So then putting away falsehood, let us all speak the truth to our neighbors, for we are members of one another. Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, and do not make room for the devil. Thieves must give up stealing. Rather, let them labor and work honestly with their own hands so as to have something to share with the needy. Let no evil talk come out of your mouths, but only what is useful for building up as there is need, so that your words may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with which you were marked with a seal for the day of redemption. Put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander together with all malice and be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and live in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Have some of you been watching the Olympics these past couple of weeks? I, I hear and some murmurs and some nodding heads. I have not caught many events live for a lot of reasons, but I have enjoyed e reading stories about the athletes and their individual stories, their team stories, watching highlights of some of Simone Biles' amazing feats and of some of those world records that were set uh, just these past couple of weeks. I saw friends, because I don't really follow the basketball side of things, but I saw friends cheering for Steph Curry and the USA men's basketball team. It's hard to believe that the closing ceremonies are tonight. 
I read a story in the paper just as the Olympics were beginning, uh, I guess it came out on July 27th, as I reflected on today's scripture from Ephesians, it came to, that story came to mind again. This is how the article starts. When Katie Ledecky arrived on the pool deck Saturday night at Paris La Défense Arena for the first final of her fourth Olympics, she looked in the bin that sits behind each starting block something of a trash can for warm up clothes and flip flops that are part of the strut to the stage. In the receptacle assigned to her spot, lane four for the top seed in the women's 400 meter freestyle, she found the green and gold sweatsuit of Australia's Ariane Titmus, the woman who was the first to track her down in the event. In an unusual exchange for the normally teeth grinding tension before a race for gold, Ledecky stepped toward Titmus. It could have been a moment to say essentially, look girl, I'm at the top dog, I'm the top dog here, move your stuff. But that's not how this relationship works. You might want a knife fight. What you get is a group hug. She was freaking out, Ledecky said. I didn't want her to feel bad or anything. Such sweetness toward your most significant rival. Wait, wrong word. I wouldn't consider it a rivalry, Ledecky said. I mean, I think it's a friendship. End quote. Katie Ledecky and Ariane uh, Titmus have a lot in common. They speak the same language with different accents. They share a tenacious, tenacious commitment to discipline and to the art and craft of swimming. And they share so many other things in common. They are different nationalities and they are fierce competitors, but that's basically it. The headline to the story is, Ariane Titmus and Katie Ledecky have pushed each other to immortality. The Australian superstar and the American legend don't like to lose, but they still like each other. The Olympics sometimes show us the ugly side of nationalism, but more often they show us how cheering on excellence is not confined to one's own nationality or one's own national team. Stories of kindness like this are needed in this world where bitter and seemingly intractable conflicts confront us every single day. If we are brave enough to read or watch the news or listen to it, fighting in Ukraine is now in its third year. And now that violence has stretched into Russia Images and stories from Palestine, Israel, and now other parts of the Middle East can make us wonder if human beings will ever be able to live in peace. Here in the United States, while divisions and rifts are not usually violent, the polarization and the vitriol that goes along with it, they are just corrosive to our common life. Today marks the seventh anniversary of the white nationalist rally in Charlottesville that began Friday night with that tiki torch march through UVA grounds and worsened the next day on August 12th with the violence that killed Heather Heyer and injured over 35 people. It's not pleasant to think about these things, especially that they might happen in our own backyard. Yet we need to face them if we're to find a way forward. I mentioned last week uh, in worship, which some of you weren't here last week, but there is a gathering later today at the UCC church from four to six, um, where a couple of people will share how they are who were directly involved in those events um, as spectators or counter protesters um, or protesters, I guess I should say, um, 
and how they've been dealing with the trauma of that day and working for reconciliation as a result. The event's called Standing Up to Hate. And again, I can tell you more if you would like to know more. It is a public event, so you're welcome to attend. Keswick, as we look across to the horses and the rolling fields and the trees, it can sometimes feel a world away from Charlottesville. And there are distinctive things about living in Keswick and in the rural parts of Virginia for sure. But of course, it is not a different world. The same can be said, it's true of cities and towns that are a thousand miles from here. And even in many ways, towns and cities that are nine, 10, I had to look it up. It's possible for some place to be 12,000 miles away from us. We are all called to find connection and to be in community, however we can work that out. The epistle for today jumped out at me as I looked at the different lectionary passages that were uh, on offer in the, for readings today. There is such intensity and urgency in the writing of this letter. Once again, in that part of the world and at those particular time, at that particular time, in those early days of Christianity, Christians who followed Jewish practices, in other words, they, they were faithful and observant Jews, and then they decided to follow Jesus, which, as you probably know, really was a sect of Judaism at the beginning. Uh, we're now encountering people who were Gentiles, non-Jews, who had come to follow Jesus, uh, but uh, sometimes the folks who had a history of being Jewish and those practices looked down on or rejected the Gentile Christians because they felt like they weren't really up to snuff. So this letter, like a lot of letters in the New Testament, is calling people to do better. The writer of Ephesians asked them to give up there, oh, some of the Gentile Christians didn't think they had to change anything about the way they were living. They could just keep living the way they were before they started following Christ. Uh, but of course, that wasn't the case either. So the writer of Ephesians asked them to give up their old ways of living. And the beginning of chapter 4, our verses are from the end of chapter 4 and the beginning, but the beginning of chapter 4 I think is worth sharing the first few verses. I therefore, the prisoner in the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And this, these are famous verses. There is one body and one Spirit just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. The writer is literally begging for a new way of life, begging for unity. It sounds pretty relevant to the United States in 2024, not only first century Palestine. The two verses that are the focus of today's message have a little bit of a tug of war going on baked into them, and uh, I like that. <laughs> it, it causes me to think. The first uh, verse that's a focus of mine is verse 25. So then putting away falsehood, let, us, let all of us speak the truth to our neighbors, for we are members of one another. Speaking the truth to each other might seem like something that's easy for us to do. Uh, perhaps we might even relish the chance to tell something what we, someone what we really think. But the end of that verse starts to tip it in another direction, reminding us that we all belong to one body. It is verses 31 and 32 that tug 
a little bit more at that call to speak truth to our neighbors. Put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander, together with all malice, and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. Balancing telling the truth with kindness and being tender-hearted is where I see a little bit of a tug of war going on. How we tell the truth to one another seems to be just, if not as important, almost as important as the truth telling itself. Sharing candidly and truthfully with people who are, or at least seem, different from us can be challenging to say the least. Katie Ledecky and Ariane Titmus, they had a lot in common. It wasn't surprising that they were kind to each other. But sharing with people who differ from us is a lot harder. We live in a world where canceling people for one thoughtless remark exists alongside 24-7 tirades that feed or seed bitterness, wrath, anger, sl wrangling, slander, and malice that we read about in Ephesians 4.31. To talk about race in any setting can be risky business. To listen to someone with different experiences around race can be painful and awkward. It is not easy, but these conversations can be so fulfilling. In today's political landscape, families and friends have sometimes had to agree never to bring up the subject of politics for fear of opening up a can of worms, or worse yet, a can of snakes. I see some heads nodding. And congregations sometimes need to do that too, and in some ways that can be a good choice, especially if we do not have clear ground rules to engage each other with tender hearts as we have these tough conversations. Our culture does not create a lot of spaces where people who are or at least seem different from each other, can share both candidly and kindly. There are plenty of places where you can shout your opinion, but there are not that many places where you can share candidly with kindness. But there are some. What a boon when that can happen through churches and other houses of worship. How wonderful for non-Christians to see people of faith fostering dialogue and inclusion instead of stoking the fires of division and exclusion. To be mercenary it can also be viewed as the best kind of evangelism. If we are showing the kind of kindness and forgiveness that God shows us, then perhaps more people would be willing to put their toes into the waters of organized religion because oftentimes all they see is division and exclusion. One of my favorite Bible verses is from Galatians, right before, uh, when I was trying to learn the books of the Bible, I memorized General Electric Power Company, Galatians, Ephesians, uh, what is it? Philippians, Colossians, because they're short and they're hard to find in the Bible. So uh, Galatians, just the, just the book before, the letter before, uh, and it's Galatians 4, 28. It reads, there is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male or female, for all of you are one in Christ Jesus. Amen. Two weeks ago, when I was visiting family in Colorado, my brother and I took uh, my mother to a worship service at a Presbyterian church that's near where my mother now lives in a retirement community. The preacher's focus that day was this Galatians text, which includes 428. And she rephrased it at near the end of her sermon uh, 
She rephrased it for our times, and she mentioned this. I abbreviated a little bit. There is no longer Republican or Democrat or Independent. There is no longer immigrant or native born, for all of you are one in God, end quote. She went on to highlight a problematic way this passage has sometimes been interpreted, and this is what I really cherished about her message. That is the wrong-headed idea that this verse means that we are to forget that there are any differences between people or just sort of pretend that there are no differences. God created human beings with differences, and that is to be celebrated not erased. I was glad that she highlighted this twisting of another verse about seeking unity in God, because we don't seek unity by creating conformity or uniformity. Uh, it's as if God wants to put us in some cosmic washing machine that's the water so hot that all our variations are removed. How boring and how insulting of God's creativity, that would be. Pastor Arnett White told me a little bit about an event that's still in the planning process, uh, but she will share perhaps a few more details about that next Sunday, so stay tuned. Uh, but as I understand it, this event is the kind of conversation that we crave and a safer space to do so. Uh, as I understand it, the event aims to inspire attendees to communicate with each other beyond our identities as members of one political party or another, as people who are white, black, brown, Asian, multiracial. Again, as I understand it, we do not ignore those parts of ourselves and pretend that they don't exist. It's just that they're not center stage. They don't need always to be center stage. By stressing our unity, by listening with kindness, perhaps we can become uh, closer, we can come closer to being tender-hearted truth-tellers with and for each other as members of one body. I love that word tender-hearted because it seems to be the opposite of hard-hearted. Following that call to put away bitterness, wrangling, and malice points us toward a way of telling the truth, yet also prayerfully and humbly being tenderhearted as we do so, and perhaps listening more than we're talking. What Pastor White has told me is very exciting, and I look forward to participating in it myself and supporting the event as much as I can, and probably South Plains will be doing so as well. If we choose the contexts wisely, where we take time to listen without bitterness and speak the truth without anger, slander, and malice, I believe that God will open a way for each of us and all of us to inch ever closer to the beloved community God desires for the whole world. Hearing the truth from others can be disconcerting, can be awkward, especially if it intersects with ideas we have about ourselves. However challenging, the call to become tender-hearted truth-tellers is a worthy one. And relying on the Holy Spirit and trusting one another, it is one that we can pursue. We won't be perfect, but we can try. Amen.